Good evening and welcome to PRS Ground Rounds, Wide Awake Surgery, Why Is It Better? Dr. Don Lalonde presenting. He's a professor of surgery at Dalhousie University. And please ask your questions throughout the presentation. Facebook Live, a comment on this video. Twitter, use hashtag PRS Ground Rounds. Dr. Lalonde will answer as many questions as possible following his lecture. Read a collection of free PRS articles on, the, on this topic, prsjournal.com, and read a collection of free PRS Global Open articles on this topic at prsglobalopen.com. And join PRS and PRS Global Open in Orlando, Florida, October 6th to the 10th. It's, in, it's intended for plastic surgeons, trainees, and other allied health professionals. Special PRS Grand Rounds Live on Pre-Pectoral Breast Reconstruction with Maurice Nahabidian and Alan Gabriel. And now we turn it over to Dr. Don Lalonde, Wide Awake Surgery, Why Is It Better? I have a disclosure. There is a Wide Awake Hand Surgery book, but I'm not making any money on it. All of the profits go to the Hand Association Lean and Green effort, which promotes less unnecessary cost and garbage in hand surgery. So why do people get sedation for surgery? They get it so they can have a pleasant experience while solving their surgical problem. The pleasant experience of sedation unfortunately includes nausea and vomiting, a big needle to get an IV, blood tests with another 20-gauge needle poke, chest x-ray, EKG, extra visits to get them, an anesthesiologist consultation, urinary retention sometimes, extra costs to attend all the visits and to get the sedation. In 2017, pure local anesthesia, wide awake surgery, can be a much more pleasant experience and much safer without sedation. Most serious complications of surgery in plastic surgery are actually complications of sedative anesthesia. All anesthesiologists agree that less sedation is safer than more sedation. The end run of that is that the safest sedation is no sedation. At the count of three, you're going to feel a little poke, and I'm going to ask you to try to not move, okay? okay. One, two, a little poke, okay. That was the worst of it. And, and I really hate needles, just despise them. This needle was nothing, absolutely nothing. It kind of pressed on my hand three times and then he put the needle in, and it wasn't uncomfortable. And then in a few seconds, it, it all went away. I felt the first poke. It was not painful. Not, not, not even a twinge. Not, no discomfort whatsoever. No discomfort whatsoever. There's a tiny, tiny prick, which is not even worth mentioning. Today, I did a wide awake a breast augmentation implant exchange in my office and the patient had the same experience. It's not just because they're carpal tunnels. I ask for feedback from each patient with each injection to get better. I put in a little bit so I see a bleb of visible, visible local. Then I pause till the patient tells me the, patient, the pain is all gone. Then I ask the patient to tell me every time he feels pain anymore until I'm finished injecting. If he only feels the pain of the first poke, I score a hole in one. If he feels pain two times, my medical student scores an eagle. If he feels pain three times, my resident scores a birdie. In this paper that we published five years ago, 25 consecutive medical students and residents were taught hole-in-one local anesthesia and then scored by patients on their very first carpal tunnel injection. 75% scored a hole-in-one, 25% scored an eagle. Anybody can do this. It's not that I'm particularly skilled. So I'd like to ask you how much the, the whole thing hurt. Could you tell us, please? Uh, I would say probably a two on the scale from one to zero to ten. Yeah, we're prepared to go on to the dentist. First of all, it doesn't hurt as much as the dentist. How much the uh, freezing hurt when I put the needle in to put in the numbing medicine? How much did that hurt? The freeze didn't hurt at all. Tell us how the surgery was. How much did it bother you? The surgery didn't bother me at all. It was lovely. And this 
it's it, nothing hurt. It was whatever, everything went really nice. Yeah, so you're feeling okay? I'm feeling okay, yeah. All right. And it, compared to going to the dentist, it hurt more of the no same? No comparison. <laughs> so you thought it was a little better? Yeah. Dentist, you feel more. Oh, okay. If you're still hurting people in the process of injecting local anesthesia, then you definitely should read this paper. All of the papers that are in green are free on the PRS website. Injecting local anesthesia should not hurt in 2017. These minimal pain local anesthesia techniques can be limited to the sting of just a 27 or a 30 gauge needle for cleft lip and nasal deformity for older kids and adults, full face and neck lifts, forearm tendon transfers, all hand and wrist operations, ulnar nerve release or median nerve release at the elbow, mini abdominoplasties, and on and on and on. So try not to move. Here we go. And I'm going to start injecting even before I go in there. And I'm going to just be extremely slow about it. And on a good day, we can get a hole in zero. So a hole in zero is she might not feel anything at all. I've quit using 25 gauge needles. They let me put in the local too fast. The 27 is my go-to needle now, unless I'm doing little kids, in which case I go with a 30 or people who are particularly sensitive. Always inject anti-grade slowly with at least a centimeter of local ahead of the sharp needle tip. The sharp needle tip should never touch live nerves. If you're going to do volunteer cleft lip surgery in developing countries under local anesthesia, please read this paper from PRS Global Open where there's videos on exactly how to inject local anesthesia with minimal pain. In this trip in Malawi, Africa with Operation Smile, three of us did the injecting, me and two residents, and the average patient scored between a hole in one and an eagle to get their cleft lip and nose fixed. This is the future of local anesthesia, but it's now. Yeah, that's me in the video. And what you're seeing is the cannula on the top right. It's a blunt tipped needle that you insert through a hole made by a bigger sharp tipped needle. I'm not feeling that cannula under my eyelid at all. It's gliding through fat. Now, these were designed for fillers, but if you inject local anesthesia through these blunt tipped cannulas, you can inject really quickly and numb a whole area quite quickly. Just try not to move here, it's gonna sting just a little bit, okay? Two, three. That's it. Way better than the dentist. <laughs> Just saying. So what you saw me do there is pinch the skin up into the needle, not push the needle into the skin. That creates sensory noise. And after we put in a little bleb of local with a 30 gauge needle, then we put in a bigger needle. And through that bigger needle, we put in the cannula and numb up the eyelids quite quickly. That is all illustrated in full video in this PRS Global Open article that's available to all of you on the PRS website. And at the count of three, you're going to feel a little sting with a 27 gauge needle. One, two, three. Sorry for the sting. You please tell me when that sting is all gone. I didn't get a... You didn't get a sting. Okay, that's good. Frequently, patients won't get a sting if you pinch the skin up into the needle, as I just showed you again. I'm putting in the first 10 cc's very slowly. This is sped up eight times. And then I'm going to put in a cannula. You always reinsert a needle two centimeter or a centimeter inside the white-pink junction. So this is clearly very white here. 
And because it's white, there's functioning epinephrine. So if there's functioning epinephrine, there's probably functioning lidocaine. Did you feel that little sting there? No. Nope. So this is a 20 gauge needle. And now I'm through that little hole. I'm going to just twirl it a little bit to make a hole in the skin. Now I'm going to insert this 25 gauge cannula. There we go. Did that hurt? Nope. So I'm going to blow up this whole donor site with 150 mils of quarter percent lidocaine and this 95-year-old with quite bad lungs. This was a day surgery local anesthetic procedure. He had no IV, no sedation, wide awake harvest of a split thickness skin graft meshed in the main operating room. We're injecting him before he comes in the main operating room and then he went home at the end of the procedure with the skin graft on his head wide awake. Much safer. The same thing with full face and neck lift. Here we have a hooked up to a three-way stopcock and putting in a total of 300 cc's, 100 for the neck and 100 for each side of the face and only reinsert the needle into an area that's clearly white. Patients sit up after a facelift. They do not throw up. There's no nausea. There's no vomiting. They sit up quietly and go home. Much safer. We're consistently getting better results with flexor tendon repair. A number of operations have better results with wide awake surgery. Now, I want you to look at that uh, thumb. You can see it looks like a beautiful FPL repair, right? But when we test it with full thumb flexion, full extension, you can see a gap starting to happen. You see that gap? That happens 7% of the time when you do a tendon repair in an asleep patient. But in this patient, we saw the gap, repaired the gap before we closed the skin, and the patient did not go on to rupture. This is like testing blood flow after an anastomosis. You don't do an anastomosis and close the skin without looking at the blood flow. You should not do flexor tendon repairs without full flexion and full extension testing to make sure there's no gap. Gaps happen because you think your sutures are tight enough, but they're not. And when you test them, you see the gap and you repair the gap so they don't go on to rupture. We avoid the worst dreaded flexor tendon problem by 7% by doing this test. And we know that it's 7%. In this paper published in PRS seven years ago, we had a series of 102 patients in which 7% we repaired an intraoperative gap. Not one of those patients went on to rupture. In fact, none of the patients at all ruptured who did what we asked them to do. We had three ruptures in the whole series. One of them went on to get back in a fight in jail, and the other two had accidents. But patients who listened to us did not rupture. That's a paper worth reading if you really want to decrease your rupture rate. And then this paper is really worth reading to decrease your tenolysis rate, the paper in green. If you test with full fist flexion and extension after you repair your tendon, you know which pulleys you can divide. We now know with wide awake flexor repair that you can completely divide the A4 pulley and up to half of the A2 pulley. You will not have to go back and do tenolysis nearly as often after you start doing your flexor tendon repairs wide awake. Please feel free to post your questions throughout the lecture on Facebook Live or on Twitter, use hashtag PRS Grand Rounds, and I'm going to answer as many questions as possible after the lecture. The other thing that wide awake surgery has taught us to do is to change the way that we do therapy. We no longer do full fist place and hold after flexor tendon repair. We now do up to half a fist of true active movement as they do in China, Australia, uh, Holland and the UK. And the reason that we do that, so here's the patient during surgery, here he is at four days doing up to half a fist of true active movement. That means it's actual true active flexion. And here he is at six weeks. 
The reason that we do that is this. This flexor tendon has been repaired, and you can see with true active movement, there's nice gliding, there's no bunching of the tendon. Now I'm going to simulate full fist place and hold. You see the tendon has stopped moving there. It's actually buckling. And then I say to the patient, hold it, watch it jerk right there. We're going to show that to you again. Simulate full fist place and hold. Right at that point, half a fist, it's not gliding anymore. It's buckling. And then we say to the patient, hold it. And when we say hold it, it jerks right there again. So we know that that's not a good way to do that. This uh, paper was written in 2007 in PRS. This has been called one of the top 50 studies ever written in plastic surgery by Scott Holtman in this book. And the reason that Scott felt this was one of the 50 most important papers in plastic surgery is because if you're doing tendon transfer wide awake, you can get the tension just right. Not too tight, not too loose. The first tendon transfer I did of EI to EPL in 1985 in a carpenter was too tight, like I was taught to do, and he couldn't grip his hammer for six months. There are many other operations where the results are much better, like tenolysis, lacertus release, uh, trapeziectomy, and a number of other operations. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about evidence-based sterility versus if some sterility is good, more must be better. What you're seeing is how more than 90% of carpal tunnels are done in Canada. And in a series of 1,500 cases, only six patients got minor infections. That's an infection rate of 0.39%. I want you to remember that number. This is the garbage to do a carpal tunnel in the main operating room on the left and in field sterility like you just saw in the last video on the right. No difference in outcome. Infection rate of 0.39%. These cases are done with field sterility in our Mohs clinic here in St. John in Canada and in Mohs operating rooms all over the United States run by dermatologists. This is the standard of care for sterility in the United States. In this paper of 20,000 Mohs cases, they had 78 cases of infection. That's an infection rate of 0.37% with field sterility, four towels, just like the carpal tunnel. 0.37%, our carpal tunnel was 0.39%. In other words, negligible. This is how we used to have to do a minor accessory oracle in our operating room in the past with full sterility just because we happened to need an anesthesiologist and the main operating room was the only place to get that. And look at the garbage for that one dinky little ear case. Now we don't have to do that anymore because we established a field sterility based on evidence in our hospital, and now we can book cases for field sterility if we're doing minor procedures in the main operating room, which happen to need an anesthesiologist. Here you see the anesthesiologist working on the patient, and you see me working with field sterility with just a small set of instruments. Field sterility has changed the way we do almost all hand trauma in St. John, Calgary, Ottawa, and many other cities and hospitals in Canada over the last 30 years. In St. John, uh, here I am putting in a K-wire with field sterility. Here I am opening a finger fracture with augmented field sterility in the clinic. We bring gowns and half sheets into the clinic when required. And we do all our trauma Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 in the clinic, not in the main operating room. So where's the evidence for how much sterility do we really need? I'll tell you something. If I'm having a total knee or a total hip done, I want the spacesuit boys. Because if I get an infected knee prosthesis, it's a huge cost for me, both in terms of my life, my money, and money for the hospital. But if I get an infection after a carpal tunnel or after a little skin cancer on my face, 
what's the harm done? Usually, oral antibiotics maybe, take a few stitches out. That's about it. We need to look at the cost of infection, both in terms of money and in terms of patient harm, with evidence-based sterility. The problem with most sterility is that it's based on custom. If some is good, more must be better. I plead with all of you to provide more research and data in evidence-based sterility so that we're not basing our practices on whether we're wearing a pink hat or a blue hat that might have five more bacteria in it. This kind of research will decrease unnecessary cost and garbage in surgery, so the world will actually be able to afford it and to afford safer surgery. Thank you. Next slide. So please read the articles that are available at hashtag uh, PRS Grand Rounds. And it's question and answer time. Okay, Dr. Lalonde, thank you very much. Uh, the first question comes from Dr. Rorick. He's asking, how long does it take to do that wide awake uh, anesthesia for the explant and implant exchange that you mentioned today? That's a great, great question, Rod. Uh, it actually took me about 45 minutes to inject the local for both breasts, and I put in uh, 400 cc's on each side with a 25-gauge 2-inch cannula, and the patient was totally comfortable to do that. Thank you for that great question. Great. And uh, Chad Purnell, any change in technique required if, you, if you're using bupivic, bupivic Bupivacaine. Yes, if I'm using bupivacaine, I have to be more careful. Bupivacaine obviously is dangerous if you get it intravascular. It stops the heart because it binds to the SA to AV node. And you may need uh, lipid emulsification rescue of bupivacaine. So bupivacaine I only use for long cases, uh, cases that might last more than two hours. And I only use small volumes of bupivacaine mixed in with large volumes of lidocaine and saline. Also, bupivacaine has an annoying problem. If you do a digital block with bupivacaine, the pain part lasts 15 hours, but the numbness part lasts over 30 hours. It's not a light switch like lidocaine. So patients will call you after surgery and they'll say, Doctor, I'm hurting, but I'm still numb. They're not wrong. The numbness lasts twice as long as the pain relief. Thank you. Okay, and uh, VD Orr is wondering how, how to get the cannulas and what cannulas do you use? So these are uh, cannulas that are designed for fillers. And if you speak to anybody who does fillers, I know that I can't name products on the uh, on the web here, but... These are filler cannulas. Anybody who's using fillers uh, for uh, hyaluronic acid uh, will know where to get these cannulas. Okay, and Shuja Shafat, excuse me if I've mispronounced your name, how long did it take you to refine this technique, and how long does it take a novice to learn it? So if we're talking about filler cannula injection of local anesthesia, it's dead easy. Uh, I... I what happened was I actually had filler myself in my eyelid. I realized it was totally painless. I came home and I started using filler injection for my blepharoplasties, and then I started using it for everything else. It's really, really quite simple. Uh, the paper in PRS Global Open describes it. Um, there's a video there that describes it. And simply, you just make sure that you have a white area and then you put in a bigger needle, like a 25 or a 22 or a 20, and through that you put a bigger cannula, like a 25 or a 27. My go-to cannula for blepharoplasty is a 27. Okay, Casey Kraft, as we become more cost-conscious in healthcare, do you think patients will begin to ask for wide-awake anesthesia? I know that patients are asking for wide-awake anesthesia all over the place. I speak to hand surgeons all over the United States all the time. And once they start doing wide awake hand surgery, the word gets around in their communities and patients want it. 
Surgeons often say, oh, my patients need sedation. My patients want sedation. In fact, a lot of people want self-control and they don't want sedation. And if they understood the difference, they would not want the sedation. I think that an easy way to choose your patients, because this is not for everybody. There are some patients who should not get wide awake surgery. They should be put to sleep. One easy way to tell is ask the patients, when you get dental procedures, do you have sedation or do you have nothing? If they have nothing to go to the dentist, wide awake surgery is easier if you take the time to learn how to inject the local properly. And this is very important. You don't just go in and hurt people. You got to be able to do it in a painless fashion. Otherwise, if you're going to hurt them, they're better off with the sedation in your hands. Okay, Pat McGuire, do you have trouble with wide awake patients moving during the procedures? Actually, uh, I kind of like patients to move during the procedures, Pat. A lot of people have sore shoulders when they're having hand surgery, for example, or a sore back. They can tell you that, so they can turn on their side, they can turn on their back. But even if somebody has Parkinson's, I can actually operate quite nicely on that hand. It's, it's really not that hard to do. You can steady the moving part most of the time. Uh, clearly, if somebody had athetoid movement, you'd be in trouble. That person would need to be asleep. But in general, small amounts of movement are not bad. It's kind of like, do you move when you're at the dentist? Can he still do your teeth even though you're moving your head around? Yeah, he probably can. Okay. And Chad Purnell, are there any procedures that you found that can't be done uh, wide awake? Procedures that can't be done wide awake? Obviously, uh, babies uh, you can't do. I, I, I've done a flexor tendon on a six-year-old girl that went extremely well. Um, I know Louise Laberge in Montreal does wide-awake autoplasties on five-year-olds all the time. Um, big cases like mutilated hands, crushed hands. I, don't, I can't do a free flap wide-awake yet, but I know that Ed Bouchelle in Winnipeg has done three wide-awake free flaps, simple ones. Um, I think that uh, replants, I still do asleep, but I know that in Taiwan, they've done a number of replants wide awake. Um, I think that uh, if an operation is really, really long and a patient will need a catheter, that patient probably would be better served asleep uh, to have the catheter in. Uh, and I think that patients who really have psych psychiatric or psychological issues those people, you don't want to wrestle with them. They're just better off asleep. And Raj saw, do we need the OR at all for these procedures? Should surgery center, sur surgery center regulations be amended to reflect this data? That's a great question, Raj. And I think that in the future, when younger surgeons start producing evidence for sterility so that we're no longer held hostage to custom-based sterility, a lot of surgery is going to move out of the main operating room, especially surgery on the face and hands where infections are uncommon and almost hard to get. Um, I think that a lot of those operations are going to move out of the operating room, both for cost and convenience purposes. Patients don't want to get naked to have their hand operated on. Uh, and But there are some procedures that are still going to need full sterility. If I'm putting on plates and screws, I'm in the operating room. If you're going to put in a permanent implant, you want full sterility. When I put in those breast implants today, that was absolute full sterility, and I can't see any other way to ever do that. So I think it's going to be based on evidence-based sterility in the future. Uh, Ira Savetsky, uh, what do you tell patients for minor procedures, those subset of patients who feel they need to be put out for every minor procedures? What, what do you tell the patients that want to be put out, for example, for a trigger finger? Yeah, that's a very good question. So first off, I ask them why it is they want to be put to sleep. And if, if their problem is fear of needles, well, then I explain to them in English a 20 gauge needle is probably six times bigger than the size of the needle that I'm going to use. So the anesthesiologist to give you sedation is going to use a needle six times bigger than the one that I'm going to use. And also, uh, Mrs. Jones, if you're 
55 years old, you're going to need blood tests. And that's going to be another needle that's six times bigger than the one that I'm going to use. So you're going to get two needles six times bigger than the one that I would use if the concern is fear of needles. Usually, um, it's fear of the unknown. And I think that if you approach patients in a very calm fashion and you say, you know what, this is really not going to bother you at all. You'll be totally amazed at how little this bothers you. Obviously, patients are going to be a lot more relaxed than if you say, well, you got two choices. I could hurt you like crazy putting in the freezing or you could be asleep with sedation. You know, I mean, look, it's all about how you talk to the patient, your confidence, uh, the way that you present yourself. But if patients have a morbid fear of the unknown, because that's what it is, once they know what it is, the fear is gone. But if they have a morbid fear of the unknown, then you have to cater to that. Obviously, you have to have a happy patient. That's the bottom line. We're not out to torture people. We're out to have them happy. Okay, from PRS. What is the public takeaway from your research on this technique? And if I'm a patient, can I request wide awake surgery? I think if you're a patient in 2017, you certainly could request wide awake surgery. And it'll at least have your surgeons thinking about it. And I think that the takeaway uh, message is that local anesthesia was invented after general anesthesia. It's actually a relatively newer development. And I think that one of the most important parts of local anesthesia is this discovery that it can now be relatively painless. And if we take away the pain of local anesthesia, and if we take away the pain of the tourniquet for hand surgery, which we've done now that we've proven that adrenaline is safe in the finger, that the whole way that we look at surgery in the future is going to change. And one more question from Raj. Uh, what precautions do you have on hand for potential anesthetic toxicity? How long do you wait prior to starting the procedure for the epinephrine effect? Uh, we wait... 26 minutes is level one evidence in humans for how long it takes for maximal vasoconstriction after injection of lidocaine with epinephrine. That was a study by McKee. And there's another study that showed that you have three times as much bleeding for carpal tunnel if you only wait seven minutes instead of 30 minutes. Seven minutes came from a 1987 pig study, and it was extrapolated to humans. It's not seven minutes for maximal vasoconstriction. It's 26 minutes. And then for lidocaine toxicity, you know, lidocaine and epinephrine are probably two of the safest drugs on the planet. Throughout the whole world, millions of people every day get lidocaine with adrenaline in dentists' offices with no blood pressure, no monitors, no EKG, no nothing. And if there was a real problem with that, we'd be hearing it all the time on TV. Hurt by your dentist? Call William McVentist. Lidocaine and epinephrine are probably the two safest drugs in the world. And I stick with 7 milligrams per kilogram, which we now know is ridiculously safe. The 7 milligram per kilogram rule was invented in 1948 when lidocaine was invented. And we now know from good evidence-based studies that you can use up to 35 milligrams per kilogram or even more with operations like liposuction with measured safe blood levels of uh, lidocaine. So the bottom line is I stick with a low dose. 50, 50 cc's is 7 milligrams per kilogram if you're using 1% width. And then I just add saline if I need... 200 cc's, I add 150 cc's of saline. And with that, it's extremely safe. If I have somebody who has atrial fibrillation or has some heart issues, I decrease the concentration of my epinephrine to a quarter or half percent, and I might do them in the main operating room with a monitor. Okay. Next one's from Kate Bohm. Do you ever add bupip bupipicane in addition to the lidocaine for extended pain relief post-op uh, procedure? Thanks, Kate. Kate's one of our residents from Dalhousie in Halifax. Yes, I do add bupivacaine for the hand cases that are two and a half hours or longer. So if I'm doing a tendon transfer, I did add bupivacaine to the uh, breast implant exchange that I did today in my office. 
And uh, I do add bupivacaine um, to blepharoplasties just for the skin poke in the beginning. Because I find that if I just have lidocaine with epinephrine, sometimes by the time I go to close my incision at the end, um, they, they can feel it a little bit. So it's a little bit like uh, I put a little bupivacaine with my epinephrine, lidocaine with epinephrine, but just a small amount. And that's all you need is just a small amount. I would like to make another point before I take another question. And that is that the quad ASF accreditation for office surgery in the United States, the same as the, uh, the CAAASF in Canada, has three categories. There's one with straight local, the second is local with sedation, and the third is general anesthesia. The cost for a young surgeon to go out and build an operating room with sedation or with general anesthesia is easily 20 times as much as straight up local. And so for young surgeons who are considering starting off a surgery in their own practice, it would almost be foolish to not get good at local anesthesia and consider doing an office with straight up pure local anesthesia and then take those patients who need sedation to a hospital or a surgery center. Okay. And uh, the wide awake augment implant exchange you did today from Pat McGuire, was it mus uh, submuscular? or subglandular? Uh, it was subglandular, Pat. That was a good question. I don't, I don't like submuscular breast augmentation. I'm a bit of a dinosaur that way. I'm like the Brazilians who do uh, mostly subglandular uh, breast augmentation. But I know that some people, like Matt Concanon, uh, do wide awake submuscular breast augmentation. He uses bigger volumes than I do. I use 400 cc's a side. Uh, Matt Concanon is using a higher volume, uh, lower concentration lidocaine uh, with epinephrine. And uh, Nikki Phillips, uh, she can imagine uh, multiple barriers to studies regarding minimal sterility techniques. Do you have any recommendations on how to get patients and institutions to buy into this concept? Oh, that's a great question, Nikki. Thank you so much for that. The magic word is quality improvement project because now there's data out there on evidence-based sterility. And so what you do is you go to your hospital and you say, look, this study has shown 1,500 cases, infection rate of 0.9%, 20,000 Mohs cases, infection rate of 0.4%. We're doing everything in the main operating room in our hospital. We would like to do a quality improvement project. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to run half of the patients for this particular operation that we're not doing in the clinic now, and we'd like to put that into the clinic with our skin cancers. And we would like to see the cost, the patient satisfaction, and the infection rate after we do it for a year. So we're going to run half our patients through this way and see what happens. Hospitals like quality improvement projects. They also like saving money. Okay. And uh, Jorge, what's your opinion when resecting fat bags and vagal reflex? Do you think it's safe doing these surgeries in the office, or would you do them uh, in the OR? You're talking about fat bags for lower lids, probably, and getting a vagal reflex. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, don't, I don't do a lot of lower lid fat bag resection anymore. Frankly, I'm doing a lot more fillers now. And I've, I have not done a lot of lower lids wide awake, so I can't answer that question intelligently. But it's a good question, Jorge. I think, you know, the, vag the whole vagal thing... Whether you're awake or asleep, you know, if you just lighten up on the, uh, on the eyes, patients recover it, recover from it. And Era, what's, what's the most common pitfall when injecting local anesthetic with regards to a painful injection? Ah, great question. The three most common reasons for painful local anesthesia is letting your needle get ahead of the local, in the first 20 years of my practice, I used to go, rawr, rawr, rawr. you know, this is going to hurt, but not long, you know, that kind of attitude. Now it's blow slow before you go. Always have at least a centimeter of visible or palpable local ahead of your needle. So that's the first thing. Never let the needle get into a live area. 
the second thing is blowing too much volume too quickly. You know, the first two cc's should be really slow and then don't move your needle, just leave it there. You know, if you put a needle right here and you put in 20 cc's, where's it gonna go? Everywhere, perfect. It's like an extravascular beer block and it blows up the whole radial side of the hand and the same anywhere else in your body. And the third main reason that uh, people hurt uh, people when they do cases under local is not enough volume. It's the pink rule. Never put a sharp object in skin that is not white with epinephrine. Because if it's not white with epinephrine, there's no functioning lidocaine either. So I like to have at least one or two centimeters of white beyond anywhere that I'm going to insert a sharp object like a K-wire or a needle or manipulate a broken bone. From Raj Preek, do you do your own regional blocks like paravertebral para blocks for breast cases or upper extremity nerve blocks for hand cases or does anesthesia do it for you? So I don't, I'm not a huge fan of nerve blocks, period. Uh, and so I don't do them myself. Uh, and I don't like it when anesthesiologists do them because they take forever to work. Uh, we are just in the process of publishing a study that shows that if you have median nerve bathed local anesthesia, it takes a half an hour at least to knock out a big nerve. The bigger the nerve, the longer it takes to knock it out. And what you never want to do is get into the epineurium and damage the nerve. That works real quick, but it's really bad for the nerve. And so I, I personally like the concept of tumescent local anesthesia that knocks out all of the small nerves and the big nerve at the same time. The big nerve is still not going to be knocked out, but the small nerves will be knocked out. And that I can trust. It's like in God we trust. I, you know, I trust knocking out small nerves quickly and well. Big nerves, not so much. Okay. And Shuja, the common thing to do to you is to use bicarbonate to decrease local anesthetic pain. Do you use bicarbonate? I certainly do use bicarbonate, Shuja, and thank you for that question. And the proper mixture is... 10 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 for each 1 cc of 8.4% bicarbonate. There's all kinds of recipes out there, but we actually had one of our residents do the chemistry for at least that concentration of 1% lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 that year. And it just so happens that a 10 cc syringe holds 11 cc's. And so when I'm doing 10 cc's of local, I drop 1 cc of bicarbonate and then pull it to the hub so that I get 11 cc's total volume. So now I have 10 to 1, and it takes the pH from an average of 4.2 to 7.4. Lidocaine with epinephrine is 1,000 times more acidic than body pH, which is why it hurts more. And that's why there's Cochrane evidence that we should all be using bicarbonate. And I do all the time. And I know there's a shortage in, of bicarbonate in North America right now, but lighten up, it's coming back in October, apparently. Okay, final question. How does your pediatric population cope with your blocks when you're explaining it to them or the parents? There's a whole chapter in the Wide Awake Hand Surgery book on how to deal with children. But I think that uh, my favorite way, and it comes from doing hundreds of lacerations at the Montreal Children's Hospital when I was a resident, is uh, I like to say to kids, do you believe in magic? And most kids who are smart will say no. Some kids will say yes. And I'll say, well, you know, I don't believe in magic. But I could do real magic for you today. And here's the magic. I could actually put medicine underneath your skin and I could totally take all of the pain away while I actually put a sharp needle and thread in your skin and sew it up. It won't hurt at all. And I promise it wouldn't hurt at all. And I look at them in the eye and if I get this deer in the headlights, I'm going to freak right out. Look, it ain't going to happen. But if I get... Sorry, the lights just turned out. I think it's a hint from uh, Dr. Rorick that it's time to quit. Um, but if, if they look at me and, and they uh, say, you know, I think that's going to be okay, uh, then I'll go ahead and do it. But you, you have to be totally honest with kids. 
You don't tell them they're not going to feel anything. Of course, they're going to feel cold and wet, and they're going to feel all kinds of stuff. You tell them they're not going to feel any hurt. You tell them that they will feel a little poke, but if they hold still, then they just feel one little poke. If they move, if they go, ah, then the needle comes out. I have to stick it in two times. It's going to hurt two times. That's not so good. So I'm going to help them try not to move by holding their hand. Is that okay? And you just talk to them in a very nice way. These aren't the droids you're looking for. You talk to them. You joke with them. It helps if you've had kids, but even if you haven't, you just got to have a way with them. And, and if you don't, it's probably not a good idea. You do a lot of kids. So I think that's it. Uh, we've finished our questions. Thank you very much for your attention.